morning. Um, picking a camp theme is not one of my favorite off-season tasks. And recently as a camp team, uh, as a board, we've been doing some, well, for lack of a better term, personality testing. And one of the things that we saw come out in the data was that Allison, uh, Brad, our executive director's wife, and, uh, and myself, and, and for that matter, Tracy, my wife, none of us are really quick decision makers. Um, so earlier this winter when the directors were meeting and we were trying to figure out a camp theme, I was just hoping that Brad would have an idea and we would run with that. and I wouldn't have to, to think about it much more. Um, but instead, he asked for our opinion. And recently, I'd been encouraged by John 16.33, uh, so I threw out the idea of overcome. It says, uh, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And uh, Allison had been thinking some about truth, but she didn't have any specific passage in mind, and so she threw out that idea, but, but yeah, didn't have a passage for it. Um, but we didn't really have any specific deadline at that point, so we just sort of tabled it and went away to think and pray about it some more, and then we'd come back to it later. Well, Brad got reading in John, uh, specifically the context leading up to 1633, and he noticed something. Truth is all over the place. Beginning in chapter 14, Jesus is giving what some have called his farewell discourse to the disciples. He's washed their feet, they've eaten the Last Supper, Judas Iscariot is left, and now um, Jesus is giving some final instructions, encouragement, and warnings to his disciples. And throughout this three-chapter-long speech, truth, specifically God's truth, is something that comes up quite a bit. Um, and what do you know? KLBC's vision statement is to show God's love, share God's truth, and build God's family. So today we'll be talking about overcoming uh, specifically by God's truth. And this idea will serve as a springboard for sharing the gospel at camp all summer long. We're planning for our first normal summer since 2019 uh, and really looking forward to it. Apparently we're not the only ones. Uh, parents are eager to get their kids out of the house and 250 kids are already signed up for camp. Maybe more than that, I haven't checked in the last couple days. It goes up all the time. Um, and, and more campers means more help is needed, whether that's junior cabin leaders or senior cabin leaders, lifeguards, cooks, custodians, maintenance, nurses. Uh, there's a whole lot of people that it takes to make camp happen. And while I think many of us have probably gotten used to planning life two weeks at a time, because who knows what's happening two weeks beyond now, um, if, if we wait till mid-June to figure out who's going to come help at camp, I'm going to go even more gray than I already have. Uh, so, so applications for summer missionaries, uh, for volunteers are open on our website, so you can just go in and apply there. You'll find everything that you need, whether it's for a couple days or a couple weeks. And the great thing is, for many of you, you're local, uh, camp is 20 minutes away, and so you can come out for the day, and that's a, that's a viable thing to do. We've got supporters from basically every direction in three for three hours or more, so uh, for a lot of them, it's hard to come out for a day, and so they come for a whole week when they come. But, but you guys can come for a day or, or, or a week or all summer, you know, whatever. Um, early camper registrations aren't the only place we've seen growth recently. Throughout the school year, we've been running COLD retreats. It stands for Christ-Oriented Leadership Development. And basically, it's three weekends for high school students to come back to camp for, for fun and fellowship and, and some pretty intentional time of Bible study. And we've been running this program for, I think, five years now. Uh, and we've never had such consistent attendance from the youth. Uh, normally, we get, um, you know, eight to ten youth a weekend, sometimes a little bit more, but, but usually it's in that number range. And there's maybe three of those youth that attend every weekend throughout the year. Uh, this year, we've been, I think it was 10 to 12 uh, every weekend, uh, sometimes as much as 15. And I think eight or nine of them came for every single weekend. And so it's been really cool to see the youth so hungry for growth, uh, for understanding, uh, doing Bible studies with them has been a ton of fun. And, and to experience godly community at a time in which a lot of their, their normal community was, was taken away, uh, for them to be able to come back to camp and, and hang out with, with a dozen other kids their own age who love Jesus uh, or wanted to, uh, it, was, it was a pretty incredible thing. One quick story from Cold. Each morning before breakfast, we would gather in the lodge living room and we would pray together quick before we send them off for for 20 minutes or so of their own uh, kind of personal time with God. And, and I think it was the first morning we did this back at our November retreat this year. And I was sitting back in my bedroom reading my Bible afterwards. 
uh, when I overheard a couple of the, the teenage guys in the room next door. And, and one said to the other, hey, you want to you wanna do, your, do your devotions with me? And the other guy, sure. Cool. Well, well, I've been reading in Matthew recently. And, and then they spent the next 10 minutes or so reading through this passage in Matthew and, and talking about it and asking questions and going back and forth. And then one of them appeared in my room with this whole list of questions that they hadn't been able to figure out the answer to. Uh, they were hungry to learn. And, and l- not just in the group Bible study times, but also in their own times. Uh, they had a desire to, to grow and, and understand and grow together. And it was a real privilege for me to get a front row seat uh, to see it happen for, for so many of them and, and to see that community uh, encourage them in their faith with Christ. Uh, one final number that is larger, uh, apparently that's a theme in this camp update, is fundraising for our dining hall project. And it's pictured there. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar, it's, it's a million dollar expansion to our existing dining hall. Basically, we're tearing off the existing kitchen some of the back areas, expanding the actual dining hall space so we can fit everybody in the dining hall, Um, and then building a new kitchen and a year-round office, uh, as you can kind of see there. And there's more information at the back on what the project actually looks like, but it's about a million-dollar project. Uh, Right now, we're up to $793,000, I think is the latest number uh, of what we have raised. It keeps changing on me. Uh, So... And it's been really cool to see God provide and above and beyond our expectations over and over again. Uh, December 31st of 2021, our goal was to be at at $650,000 raised. And that seemed kind of lofty, especially when you're a month away from that and still 150,000 short or something like that. And then we started January 1st with 675,000 raised. Um, it's It's been really cool. And I haven't been the primary fundraiser. Uh, but to see God provide beyond our goals and our expectations. Um, currently, we're working with the park uh, to receive final permits and approvals, uh, and then we need to reach about $810,000, which we're almost at now, uh, by June, plus another 160000 or so in security funds a little later on in summer. Uh, our contractor is beginning to talk with uh, local businesses and, and tradespeople interested with the project and figuring out plans and things. And in summary, uh, God is providing, basically. There's a little ways left to go. And, and if things continue to progress in the way that they have, uh, we're planning on starting construction right after Labor Day, doing youth kickoff Labor Day weekend, and then the backhoe comes in the next day and starts tearing things apart. Um, so what does all that mean for you? Sorry, was there? Let's go. Well, ah, there. Uh, what does all this mean for you? Well, if you're able to come volunteer this summer, whether it's for a day or for a week, uh, go apply on our website. All the information is there. Uh, if God is putting it on your heart to give, you can reach out to the camp office or grab information at the back. Um, there's also camp coffee at the back there, and I don't want to steal from the church's coffee thing. Uh, so if you're buying church coffee, keep doing that, and then just add the camp coffee onto your coffee consumption. Uh, any So the regular size bags are $15, the little bags are 5 bucks, and all the proceeds from that coffee goes to the dining hall project. Um, and it's just been a cool little way. As you, as you grind up some beans, pray for camp and, and, uh, and support uh, what God has been doing there. Uh, and when you're praying for us, praise God for the ways that he's been working, uh, for his ask for his continued provision of campers, of leaders, volunteers, and, and funds so that we can continue to do uh, God's work through KLBC. The last couple of years, it's been uh, smaller camps, but it's been really cool to see God continue to work. Uh, but being smaller, we've had less people involved, less leaders, less volunteers. And so this year, as we try and, and get people to come back to camp, uh, there's a lot of people to, to bring and a smaller pool to draw from. So it's kind of starting from scratch a little bit, it feels like. And so if you are able to, to come and, or to pray, you know, do both. Um, come and pray that God would send the right people. Uh, our theme verse for this summer is John 16, 33. Uh, but to really understand that verse, I think you need to have an idea of what Jesus has been saying since the start of chapter 14. And I'll just be skimming the surface this morning. I can't possibly hope to cover everything that Jesus talked about in those three chapters in 20 minutes or so. Uh, but hopefully I can pull out some key themes and ideas uh, that, that can help you to make some more connections as you continue to read and study. Um, 
even in just one verse, in 1633, you can start to see a pretty big idea in Jesus' last words to his disciples. The world. Um, it reads, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. He's mentioned it several times in the last few chapters, and though we won't look at chapter 17 this morning, Jesus mentions the phrase, the world, 19 times in that chapter alone. Uh, so I think it's fair to say that the world is a pretty significant idea in Jesus' mind. But the world as an idea here doesn't stand alone. It's, it's contrasted with something, life in Christ. And, and that's a battle that I think all of us are familiar with. I'm not a big fan of doing dishes, personally. I mean, I like when they're done, but I don't want to be the one to wash them. Um, I'm, I'm sure I'm not alone in that. Uh, in fact, at the camp I grew up working at when I was a cabin leader, my brother and I, we made up a little song about how much we disliked doing dishes, and we would, we would sing it as a round with our kids sometimes, you know, just complaining about doing all the breakfast dishes and having Rice Krispie floaties in your water in the deep sink so that your back hurt at the end of it. Anyway, uh, so we would have a lot of fun singing it. We'd get our campers involved, do a round, like I said. Um, not exactly the most Christ-like, servant-hearted attitude that you want from your cabin leaders, right? But, uh, but it was fun. Even now, most of the times that I'm doing dishes, there's this inner battle that takes place. Uh, my flesh wants to, to ignore the dishes, to, to go collapse on the couch or uh, be distracted by my phone or um, hope that someone else will do them. Be selfish, be lazy, it'll feel good, right? But there's this other part of me that sees it as an opportunity to uh, love those around me, to serve them, to put my own desires aside and put their, put their desires first. And if Jesus did anything in his time on earth, it was to put other people's needs before his own. Now, the dishes thing is a pretty trivial example, but I'm sure you can all think of examples in your own life or the lives of those around you. Um, situations where the world is offering something, right? A little more money and you'll be happy, right? Enough likes on social media, you'll finally feel loved. Uh, the newest toy or gadget or phone or truck or whatever it is, and, and then life will be good, right? One more episode and you'll finally be well-rested or, or content or, or something. Um, but in my experience, as we chase these things, we come up feeling even emptier than when we started. A, a broken world can offer us nothing but more brokenness. And when I read that Jesus tells his disciples, in the world you will have trouble, I automatically think of them being persecuted for their faith. And certainly he's telling them that that will occur. Right? But when we zoom out a little bit more, we see that it isn't just um, believers that have troubles in this world. Right? Sin, death, brokenness, these things are so prevalent. We all encounter them daily. Um, everybody encounters them. The, the question is, between the world and Christ, where does your allegiance lie? Where are you putting your hope, your trust? Each of Jesus and the world are offering us something. In Jesus, there's peace. In the world, there's, there's tribulation, there's trouble. And when you put it that way, it doesn't seem like much of a competition. Uh, Jesus said, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And Jesus said virtually the same thing earlier in, in 1427. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. The disciples are about to face some pretty intense and scary situations. Jesus is about to be hauled away and murdered on the cross, right? This, this Messiah, the one that they're hoping will bring a great military victory and, and uh, liberate Israel from Roman occupation, he's about to be humiliated and killed, and their own association with him is going to put their very lives at risk. It's, it's really no wonder that Jesus is taking a moment to warn them uh, and to make clear to them that he is offering them peace, even in the midst of trials that they can't yet imagine. I, I grew up in a church that talked about peace quite a bit. If, if I remember right, there was even a dove incorporated in the church logo. Um, peace was an important idea. And in my mind, it was a pretty simple idea, right? You know, not fighting or being at war, turn the other cheek, be calm, just relax, send a candle, sunset, you know, that kind of stuff. Not bad things, right? But also not the kinds of things that really got me excited. Um, now, perhaps I was a kid who just didn't fully understand what his church was talking about. I, I'm sure I was the first. Or, or maybe, you know, I, I had a pretty limited worldview. Uh, didn't realize how significant that idea of peace really was. But, 
But recently, I've come to think of peace, um, biblical peace, in, in quite a different way than I did when I was a kid. It was actually in preparation for one of our cold Bible studies uh, a couple years ago. Over the weekend, I was planning to take uh, a deeper dive into Advent, and, and specifically the four themes traditionally associated with it, faith, hope, peace, and love. Uh, and for each study, I was going to show the Bible Project video associated with that word. And if you're unfamiliar with the Bible Project, it's an online, they're online, they have tons of different resources, podcasts, videos, um, they've got an app now, all sorts of stuff, it's all free, and it's great for helping to understand the Bible better. So I use it all the time. Um, anyway, as this video traced the idea of peace throughout scripture, it defined it not just as the absence of war, but the presence of completeness or wholeness especially in the midst of complexity. Uh, think of a, a brick wall, right? This is the, the analogy that the video used. Uh, with each, each brick uh, counted for in proper line with the others, they're all standing tall and strong. They're working in harmony as they were intended. It's, it's whole, it's complete. There are, there are many parts, but they're all doing what they're supposed to do, and, and it is, as a result, this peaceful wall. Now think of a broken down brick wall. Right, bricks are scattered, they're missing, they're broken in half and cracked. The whole thing is leaning at a dangerous angle. To bring peace would be to restore to wholeness that which is broken. Right? To, um, to put everything back in place as, as it's supposed to be. It, it takes a lot of work. It's not just calm meditation or turning the other cheek or, or even learning to be content with a broken wall. Uh, it, it takes real effort. And when we think about peace in this way, as completeness or wholeness, especially in complexity, Jesus' statements like, my peace I give to you, it makes a whole lot more sense. Uh, Jesus is the whole, complete human that you and I could never be. Right? He lived a life on earth free from sin, in perfect relationship with the Father, the way that God intended for us to live. And now, apart from any of our own effort or merit, Jesus offers us this wholeness, his completeness as a gift, his righteousness. In overcoming the world, sin and death on the cross, Jesus is able to offer us his life, this great exchange where he takes our brokenness and our sin and the punishment that we deserve, and instead he gives us his completeness, his wholeness, his righteousness. In Jesus, we can have peace. In this broken world, you don't have to look far to see that it's very broken. Uh, this broken world can never offer us that kind of wholeness. It can offer us troubles. It's got lots of those to share, but, but really nothing else. And, and this is what Jesus is saying, that if we want to overcome the world, we can only do it through him because he's already overcome it. We are not overcome because he has already overcome. Here's the annoying part, though. Um, we still live in the world. And as much as Jesus, is, as much as believers' lives are, are hidden with Christ, as Paul says in Colossians 3, uh, we wake up each morning here on planet Earth. Uh, there's this tension. We live in Christ where we can have peace, but we also live in the world where troubles are waiting for us every day. And while Jesus has overcome the world and we eagerly look forward to his ultimate return and victory, in the meantime, we're left here on Earth at war with the world. So how has Christ equipped us for this battle? Being properly equipped, having the right help, it can be critical in getting something done. I, I grew up on the farm, and so my brother and I, we would, we would often help my dad with, with different projects that he had going on. And one spring, we were faced with a particularly difficult project, uh, putting up a bison fence through the middle of a slough. Uh, there used to be a fence there, but then in spring, the ice had melted and carried the fence away, and uh, we weren't thrilled about the idea of just hoping that the bison wouldn't notice the 300-foot gap in their fence. Um, didn't, didn't feel good about that, so we had to fix it. I think the first thing we tried was using an old water trough as a canoe uh, to work out there, and it was shaped, you know, kind of like a canoe, long and kind of skinny, except that it was square, so it had square edges and the square bottom, and um, basically just a big box. Um, let me tell you, there's a reason that canoes aren't designed like that, uh, it took us about 20 seconds to capsize. Uh, my brother and I went, uh, went out on the maiden voyage. My dad, knowing better, stayed on shore. My brother and I got very wet very quickly. Um, so already being wet, we just waded in. It was only about chin deep at its deepest point, um, but not exactly clean. 
And so we, we held the sides of the trough down, uh, trying to keep it upright as my dad was in the middle of it with trying to pound the posts in. Um, and if, you, if you're wondering how stable it is um, when, when a man is standing in the middle of a square-bottomed boat swinging a large hammer over his head, um, well, I'm just sad I wasn't wearing a GoPro or something. Um, eventually, we did get all the posts in, and we all got wet. And so the next step was to string wire across. Uh, we borrowed a couple kayaks from a neighbor, and the, the plan was we would just attach the wire to the back of the kayak, paddle hard, and go right across, and easy peasy. I think we made it about 20 feet before the weight of the wire and the algae that it immediately caught stopped us dead in our tracks. All this to say, uh, when fencing in a slough, I recommend you get better help than a couple of teenagers and uh, use better equipment than a square bottom trough and, and two kayaks. Um, but our, believer, our battle as believers against the world is, is even more challenging, I would say, than building a fence through a slough. So what kind, of, what kind of help, what kind of equipping does Christ give us? And this is where we get back to that idea of truth that I mentioned at the beginning. Near the start of Jesus' farewell discourse, he tells his disciples, and this is in John 14, 16, and 17, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth. And as a bonus, let me continue. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. Again, the world is contrasted with life in Christ. You, you just can't have both. But anyway, uh, Jesus is telling his disciples that he will send a helper, even more effective than two teenage boys. The spirit of truth. And later he clarifies that the Holy Spirit will, will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. Later that he will bear witness about me and he will guide you into all truth. Now this is by no means an exhaustive detailing of the roles of the Holy Spirit, but, but it's pretty clear, I think, that the truth is a significant part of his ministry. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so to know the truth ultimate truth, is to know Jesus. He is truth. And to know Jesus is to know God, to receive his life, uh, to claim his victory over the world, to, to overcome. You see, truth brings things to light. Lies seek to deceive. Truth brings life. Lies, lies bring death and, and destruction. And I could say that again, but, but swap a couple of things. Jesus brings things to light. The world, it seeks to deceive. It offers empty promises. It has since the garden, and it continues to do so today. Jesus brings life, completeness, wholeness. He is life. The world, it brings destruction and trouble and brokenness. So the Holy Spirit it glorifies Jesus. It reminds us of who he is, of, of what he said, how he wants us to live. And as Jesus said in John 14, 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and he will come to him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Jesus wanted his disciples to be, to be focused on him, on what he had taught them, so that when troubles came, and he promised him, them that troubles would come, um, that they had a foundation to fall back on, a relationship with God to rely on, just as, as Christ leaned on the Father throughout his trials, that the disciples could, could do the same. When we are focused on truth, on Christ, then we can ignore or we can overcome the lies around us. We are able to overcome the trials of life because our focus is on Christ. And I don't mean this in a name it, claim it, life is going to be wonderful in, e in every way, kind of a way. I mean this in a we know that ultimately Jesus wins and we can have hope in the difficulties that we face. Listening to the spirit of truth, it brings light into dark situations and it breathes life into us uh, when we need it most. It is because Christ has overcome the world that this is all possible. We are not overcome because he has already overcome. And it connects well with Matt's been talking in Romans 8 the last couple weeks, um, and, and I was reading some in there, and, and it ties in wonderfully that the spirit of life sets us free from the law of sin and death, right? It's this idea that God has claimed a victory for us that we can never claim on our own, and we can be free, uh, we can overcome because of him. When I was in Bible school, I took a class on homiletics, it's a fancy word for preaching, um, and one of the lessons that sticks out to me 
from that class is that the congregation should never walk away from the sermon thinking, I just need to try harder or, you know, I need to do X to get Y or, or something like that. Instead, we should leave here encouraged at how good God is, at how amazing the salvation that he offers us really is. Uh, knowing that, that he already did the work, he's, he's done it. And we just get the simple joy of partnering with him in this new life that he offers us and, and sharing that with others. So let me read the theme verse again here. And as I do so, consider where it is in your own life that you've been putting your trust and your hope. Is it, is it with the world and its ultimately empty promises or with Christ and the wholeness and, and completeness that he offers? And may you also be encouraged as you consider the great and abundant peace that, that he does offer us, this completeness, this, this wholeness. It isn't easy to achieve that kind of peace, but he doesn't leave us to try and earn it on our own. Uh, we can overcome because he has already overcome. Praise God. So let me, let me close in, in reading this verse. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have troubles, but take heart, I have overcome the world. God, thank you for sending your son, uh, that you didn't leave us uh, to our own demise, uh, that that you came and you rescued, you overcame, and you offer this great exchange that we can trust in you, put our hope in you, and that ultimately you win. Uh, God, you, you have overcome, and so we can overcome because of you. And we are so grateful uh, that you offer us this new life and, and this opportunity to partner with you in that, in, in living it out and showing the world how good you are. May we do that well. Uh, this in your name we pray.